Tibbers, Tibets, and of course, my favorite group of all, my colorful collection of crazy people. This video truly is just came out of nowhere, out of left field during a casual conversation over coffee. The last couple of weeks, I've made the acquaintance and the pleasure of knowing a gentleman by the name of Paul, who has a YouTube channel called World Zoom. And we were talking about this and talking about that, and this topic and the subject of Thailand came up because he lived in Thailand, and just by coincidence, I was living in Thailand at the same time, 2010. And he told me a story about how, as while he was an administrator at a hospital there, he was the big kahuna, he was arrested, he was deported, and he was blacklisted. Now, I'm not going to give away the story here in the introduction. I would encourage you to watch the video if you'd like to find out the details. And the caveat on this, or the cherry on top, rather, is who his roommate was while he was in a Thai prison. All right, without further ado, here comes the story. All right, so Paul, you were administrator in Bangkok at a hospital. I was, yeah. I was a president and CEO for uh, six years in Thailand in total. Uh-huh. And then what happened? <laughs> well, they had uh, the red shirts and the yellow shirts battled in the... Uh, in the government, if you remember, sort of a group that was pro-monarchy uh, and pro of the king, as I am, and then a group that was pro-military, and they supported the military junta. What year was that? 2010. I was there. Yeah. I was living in Phuket. So anyway, and I remember red shirts, blue shirts, or something like that. And I remember not being able to get out of the country because they shut down the airports. Yeah, they took over the airport and shut it down as a protest against the government. And what did they do with the hospitals? Uh, they blocked off the hospital and they set up roadblocks on Sucumbent Soy, the main road in, in Bangkok. And so uh, on any given day, I had, uh, at least at that hospital, I had 16,000 employees. So I had to both get all my doctors and nurses and everyone else to work in Bangkok, but I also had thousands of patients. Uh, about 70% of my business was outpatient. And so people were driving in. We had these huge, huge parking structures. We had hotels, we had apartments. We had everything you could imagine, but I need the people to be able to get there. And so the people that aren't weren't very well said they used it to their advantage to block off the city the military and, or the police uh, or uh, it was not n neither one of those they were in support of the military but they weren't necessary the military was there but they were allowing people through oh, so the military the people was. that were mad at some group one group or another were blocking off access to the hospital. That's it. That's okay. right. And they uh, wanted paid. All they really wanted was money to be able to pass through. So if you had the military... Wanted, in other words, they wanted a little bit of this. That's you know exactly I mean? right. Yeah. 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 That's so exactly they right. A they, little bit of this. And then you can come into the hospital. That's it. And you were paying how much to get people into the hospital? I would say my total expenses for the month period was probably a million dollars US. For how long? A mil a one month. To get people in about the past a, and pay the bribe. About a million dollars U.S. A million. Because I had thousands a day. And they wanted reimbursed when they got there. And some weren't good at negotiating the rate. And so they would pay and they would come to the front and want to know how much, you know, want the money back to be able to park in the parking garage and the others. So, okay. Yeah. And then didn't a reporter come and talk to you? Yeah. Uh, uh, this is someone, where the fun begins. Yes, it is. Yeah, <laughs> someone came from the Bangkok por Post and said, "Hey, you're a foreigner. You run this this hospital, and all your executive staff are Americans. And you know, what do you think about the politics of this?" And of course, I was supportive of the king. Mm -hmm. You know, because I'm supportive of the king. At that point, it was Rama Nine, the current king's father, okay. not Rama Ten. 
right? And I'm a backer. I'm a believer. I like him. I okay. always have. He's passed away several years ago, but he did some great things. And of course, I'm not stupid. I, anything that's going to be political, I'm going to be supportive of the king, whether I disagreed or not. Uh, and so I, I did that in, you know, in the article with the Post. So where you, they, how long was the article? Uh, I would say it was probably, it was on the front page of the newspaper, right? And, and what was the name of the newspaper? The Bangkok Post, the main newspaper of Thailand. And you were being critical of these people blocking you, your patients getting in, or what was, what was the gist yeah, of the Yeah, my criticism was that they're stopping an embarrassing Thailand, closing the airport, supporting the wrong groups, supporting a military junta basically instead of the elected officials. So we had an elected prime minister, uh, Taksin Shinawatra, his sister Yingluck Shinawatra. They waited for them to leave the country. They took over the country, kicked them out, and took over themselves. And I was critical of that. So you criticized that? I did. And after you, that article came out, what happened to you? The police came me the very next day and arrested me uh -huh. and put me in prison, put me in jail. How long were you in jail? Uh, for me, uh, it lasted uh, about, I think it was 21 days or 22 days that I was actually in the Thai prison. Uh, so it was the immigration prison. Uh, Bong Kwong was the separate prison, but I went to the immigration hold. So in the prison that I was in, it was very, very overcrowded. The majority of the people that were there were from Myanmar, from Laos, uh, from Vietnam, but there's also probably 40 foreigners, I'd say, at that point. Um, you know, a, a large group of foreigners that were there, mostly for simple overstays. Okay. You know, some of them had been overstays for a long time, like years they'd yeah, overstayed, yeah. and they were in a little bit more trouble. But the deal is, if you get in trouble and get arrested in Thailand for the overstay, you can't. You have to have an onward ticket, right? And they will escort you from the prison to Sawanapum, put you on the plane, and you're gone. Yeah. And you have the risk of being blacklisted depending on how long uh, you have overstayed. Um, but that's not what you were in for. Uh, no, I was in for... Uh, uh, saying something against the government and you know being uh, boisterous against and not against the king i was never charged i was no, never they, charged with anything were, i was i was never charged with less they wanted majest, to deport you right they wanted to deport me they did in fact deport me uh so i i tried to fight that for a period of time and the lawyers the ho the hospital executives came forward to speak on my behalf but they basically said you know, I was speaking out of turn and talking about politics, you know, in Thailand and that, you know, I had no right to do so regardless of my position. Although my complaint was that they were putting people's lives in danger by blocking our oncology treatments, blocking our hospitals. Uh -huh. My hospital staff didn't have small money to be able to get through them through the roadblock and they blocked the roadblock and it'd be 40, 50 deep. We're letting through one car and one ambulance so at a time. every time one of your employees or patients wanted to come in, they had to pay, and you had to reimburse. That's right. And that cost a million bucks. Yeah, it so was. So I a could see where you would be a little hot under the collar. Yeah. So when this reporter came in, you just told him the deal. I, I was stupid. You know, I was really stupid. Well, we knew I, that going in. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I knew, I knew better. You know, Mr. PhD. <laughs> right, right. I mean, you can't do that shit in, no. you know, in the foreign countries. You know, you might be able to get get away with it here, Thank you know, you. in the Philippines. But no, you, not really. Yeah, but no, you certainly could not do that. You don't want to do it, right? No. Yeah. So one day you're sitting in your high-priced office being a big shot, and the next thing you know, you're sharing a latrine with about 40 guys. That's right. When I first went ooh, in, ooh, they ooh, just ooh. brought me in, and there was one uh, hole yeah. uh, that was in the middle and a bucket for you to take oh, your poo. Oh, oh, oh. There was no toilet paper, Beautiful. just the things from there. So I was wow. the only foreigner, you know, in there. Luckily, I speak Khmer. I speak the Cambodian language, and so they put me with the Cambodians. 
There weren't any ties in there. None of them had done anything to be in that jail. So the U.S. embassies came the second day uh -huh. to visit with me and see how I was doing, and they got me out of there and put me with the other, with the foreigners, with the okay. English and Norwegians, and I still don't think there was any Americans beside me. There were Russians, there were Chinese, several Chinese, and some of those guys were in big trouble. I mean, well, who was your cellmate? You were telling me they put you into a cell and you had a cellmate. Who was yes, that Yes, if you remember the Merchant of Death, the Nicolas Cage movie, he most recently was uh, uh, given up in uh, an exchange with the Russians and the U.S. for the basketball player, Brittany Griner, uh, was traded uh, for him. and he His was roommate. Yeah, that was my roommate in the Thai prison was that wow. gentleman, Victor Bout. Uh, was his name B O U T? If you want to check it, you Back know on YouTube. This. Google this. Yeah, Google that. He's worth reading about because he was the real deal. You know, I was a guy that had never even got a parking ticket. Right? I literally had never had a parking ticket. Now you're hanging and out I, with the merchant. Yeah, of death. they said like he introduced himself like I'm Victor Bout, and I thought, Jesus, I know that name. You know, and you could buy cell phones or get cell phones from the. I called my mom and said, Mom, who the hell is Victor Bow? She goes, I don't know. I said, check it out. He seems like a bigwig. He's like running the show in the prison. She goes, my God, you're with the merchant of death. I thought, well, that doesn't sound good. You know, <laughs> that, that, that's, uh, I'm with the who now? <laughs> who? It'll keep you up at night. Exactly right. Couldn't have been a nicer guy. But, really? Yeah. I want to get into that. What was, did you guys have it? conversations i mean did he tell you about himself or did you yeah. guys just talk about the weather i don't know he what? said that the u.s tricked him to come to thailand for an arms dealer so they set up a, some african country wanted to meet in a neutral country not in russia wanted to meet in to buy arms. uh to buy arms okay. and this victor bout was the main arms salesman for russia previous colonel uh, in the military, wow. and he ended up getting a 30-year prison sentence in the U.S., even though he'd never been to the U.S. So, and didn't the yeah. U.S. military come in and like grab him or something? They one did. Day? Yeah, we were there, and they came in and brought him. Uh, Russia was negotiating. Mr. Putin was uh, was negotiating with Russia to have him released back to Russia. The U.S. thought that that was probably going to happen, so they came in and scooped him up and wow. and brought him by private plane to the U.S. and put him on trial. And you couldn't hitch a ride with them? You know, that that would have been a much better route than, than the route that, that I was going to go. So, I mean, they I had a, a home, you know, and I had an apartment that I was living in, and all of a sudden I was in a prison, literally a prison where... They only gave us white rice and a bowl of cucumber soup three times a day. At least you and, got something on your stomach. Well, you know, it was Victor that took me around to the different places, said, this is the gym. If you speak with the ties, they'll let you work out here. Wow. This is the guard that you can go to if you want to go to the edge of the prison uh -huh. that normally had a red uh, stripe around it and you couldn't approach the wall. And so if you wanted food, I hate cucumbers. <laughs> so, you know, and I wasn't to the point quite where I was starving to death yet. But, you know, Paul, it was no joke. I weighed 240 wow. pounds when I went. Yeah. 240 pounds. I was loaded with muscles. A big, big guy. I weighed 102 when I left. 182. 182. When I, 182. Sorry. How, when I, how long? When I left. Uh, almost three weeks. So you didn't total, eat much so. in three weeks. It was I like mean, I, there, wasn't any, there wasn't anything to eat. I was Holy starving Lord. and I had, you know, some medical issues like everybody there. So it was a really bad situation for me. All what I kept arguing is that you're letting everyone else go and buy a ticket. Yeah. And and you know they're leaving so they're coming in leaving and you have these chinese guys that had drug offenses some of them got the death penalty mm. some of the guys that i was with were actually going to get and ended up getting the death penalty during the time that i was there so, so how did you finally get out of there uh the u.s embassy gave me a one-day passport and negotiated my release that i could go to phnom penh and so I literally, they brought me to Swanapoom, gave me a one-year blacklist. They blacklisted, from, so they blacklisted me from one year. They gave me, that was the negotiated amount. I paid a fine, which was substantial. To the Thai I, government. To the Thai government. It was a lot of money. I'm you over, over yeah, it was a lot. Okay. And uh, they, they got me in the police and drove me to uh, 
was that Sw yeah it was Swanapum it was open then it wasn't the other and uh, and out of the country I went and said in 365 wow. days I could reapply uh, for a work visa or reapply for a visa or to be able to return to Thailand I did uh, do that after one year and I was turned down so they gave me a one-year blacklist I applied it was still the same people in power uh -huh. Uh, over the course of the next year then after that, they fell from power. They had a new election, a new prime minister, and that military Huna got in trouble themselves. Okay. Right, from the thing. So then I applied again when they fell from power and I was able to have no charges against me. No, Nothing was charged and uh, my blacklist was removed. So I've been there a couple times since. So I've no. been able to travel to and from Thailand since that time. That's, that's, that is an incredible, massive story. I lost my job. And I mean, it was a big job. It was you a know, big half, job. Half so a million US dollar a year For one conversation plus with one journalist, you go from a big thing, high power, executive job, yep. to prison, to being shipped out, 80 right. pounds lighter or whatever, yep. probably not feeling too good. Not feeling well. Blacklisted and I mean, that would, that's just, uh, it's remarkable. Did, did you sweat it out when you were like, the blacklist was, was lifted, right? The ban yeah. was lifted. Yeah. When you went, did they stall you at all at immigration when you went in the first time? Well, I had applied again to be able to have a visa and they turned me down and said I was no longer available to be able, I was still blacklisted, okay. right? And so when I tried to go again, I was in Phnom Penh. And so I went to the border crossing by car, oh. right? So I decided to go up to Siem Reap. I crossed to the border, which is porous, uh -huh. I guess, from there. Uh -huh. But I, it wasn't poor enough for me to get in because immediately when I got through from, from Cambodia and Lyft, I attracted everybody's attention. They had everybody there checking on me. But they made whatever their calls and what they did, and they decided I was going to get 30 days. I didn't have any visas or anything like that. I just got a tourist visa for the 30-day period. I stayed longer than that, and then I flew in after that. I actually came from the U.S. directly to Sawanapum in, in Bangkok in 2019 and had no issues. I think cool. maybe the record's even gone. I don't know. There was no record of me having any issues there You know when I stayed. Uh, three or four years ago. That is a fascinating story. <laughs> yeah. That I would not beautiful. recommend Thai prison. I wouldn't recommend any prison. Right, right. Here in Thailand would be right. a, a bad place to so go. So it was the embassy came to your rescue. They wow. did, yeah. They got me out of the, with the Cambodians, which wasn't that, well, I mean, I'm comfortable with them because I'd spent a lot of time with them and I speak their language, right? Okay. But still, they were the poorest of the poor and the Thais did not treat them well. And so if they didn't treat them well, they didn't really treat me very well, you know, either because there were 40 of us in a cell. And so we had to take turns lying down. So oh, we sure. couldn't, not everyone could sleep at the same time. Uh, so, and you only got out two hours per day. You got out from nine to 11 in the morning, you could leave your cell. So you spent 22 days in that cell with just a blanket, no pillow, just a blanket. You know, and that's all what you What was had. the first thing you did when you got home to America? Um, you know, I went to, uh, this is uh, ridiculous, but I went to Taco Bell. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't sound ridiculous to me. I don't I know why the, cra for I don't know why the craving hit me on the Taco <laughs> Bell, but I landed in Indianapolis and my parents were there and I was a little, you know, shell shocked. I wouldn't call it like post traumatic. You know, right, I'd been right, a military right. officer, but right. there was nothing I experienced being a military officer like that. So yeah. when they straight ass throw your your butt in prison and you're pooping in a hole and you have no toilet paper from living a pretty easy life of never even being in any trouble. Yeah. You know, I'd always been on the other side of the law, right, you know, right, the right. good side. So now I was blacklisted, lost my job, dirt bag, you know. So, you know, and, what do, what do and you And nothing's changed. And not, I'm still all those things. Now I just like to poop in a bucket just because it seems normal to me. So I can't stop it. I love it. <laughs> All right, well, I got a, his ankle bracelet's going on. Yeah. So we're going we're gonna to cut this short and get his ass back to jail. We'll see you guys in the next video. I'll see you guys.